said all that, horizontal strokes that extended to their very souls. Tovs, deeply entrenched into their very beings. An ideogram, typical of that time. Typical of good inclination, or typical of some bad inclination. Typical of some good fortune, or typical of some bad fortune. Now, knowing all of that, that calf with the opposite top direction is rightly to be regarded as bad, with some bad fortune ahead, since that golden calf is about to get crushed, about to get melted down and powdered, possibly via acacia gum, a prevalent tree in the area. Now, other cool elements that you might notice in our graving are the very alert ears and perhaps even a horn protruding from the head of that cow, as well as some spew being ejected from the very mouth of that cow. Spew being ejected upon his very own tough, upon his very own soul, so to speak, feeding its bovine malignancy. Notice also the penetrating eye of the cow in our inscription. I'm going to scroll back. A penetrating eye that I'll be pointing out in my upcoming Golden Calf article as well. An upcoming article that specifically addresses the Second Commandment violation that occurred about 600 meters away. An article that specifically addresses the actual calf construction on that local smelter. A well-rounded smelter that just so happens to look a whole lot like the terrain that our calf is standing on there, standing in the middle of a large rock formation, standing in the middle of a formation that is curving inwards at the outsides, unlike legs might naturally do. So no, those are not proper calf, proper calf legs in our inscription, folks. Not proper cow legs. No, not unless it has a spider anatomy, a spider missing a good few legs. So, a calf standing at a low spot, as if this calf were arising from a low spot on this heart-shaped formation. Arising from a valley. Or to give you a bit of a heads up, arising from a boulder that was extensively drilled and chiseled. Chiseled to make a form. Filling that, a calf pictured as arising from the exhaust vent of a very well con contoured combustion chamber. A chamber with a large venturi opening, as you will see. A large venturi opening in order to drive the hot combustion air. Yes, the descending combat catabatic wind at sundown. From the nearby mountain, directly into their fuel of choice. Charcoal a hyper-dried wood from an easily built kiln. A kiln that we will also be showing you just a little bit later in our next article. But for now, here's a sneak peek of that working class smelter, the business end of that iconic smelter. Pretty awesome smelter, actually. A smelter complete with a sturdy seat on which to place a cauldron, on which to place a ceramic crucible, a gold melting crucible, which was accessible and crucial. A crucible melting crucible, if you'll pardon my alliteration. A god melting crucible that ultimately demanded a death-defying crucifix. Crucible it! Crucible it! The misguided mob shouted. Just as I would have done. As I would have done since I have built and rebuilt many combustion chambers. I've worked on numerous foundries in my day. 
you know, worked on numerous smelters, having held oil, gas, and even wood burner certificates. Just not those using charcoal as fuel, no. That's a little too primitive for me. Foundries that were melting cast brass, bronze, magnesium. Yet gold will be in our upcoming article. An article where I will address this foundry of unfaithfulness. This iconic foundry in the wilderness. Where I will discuss this second commandment violation in much greater depth. Before we get to my third commandment article. The third commandment applied most commendably. Magnum Opus article. So hang in there, folks. Commandments that are completely unique to the Hebrews, incidentally. So don't be thinking of these those commandments as plagiarism, folks, as if borrowed from a human, as if borrowed from a rabbi. No, this sort of chat is totally GPT. Totally God providence talk. No doubt about it. But back to our present engraving. In much the same pictographic way, we have what may be assumed to be Moses standing upon the middle rock of the trinity of rocks. Moses represented as standing upon the slightly lesser height, Mount Sinai, although appearance is somewhat deceiving. Moses standing upon the lesser peak of that intimidating mountain range, when in fact he was standing on the summit itself standing on the top of the mountain, as we read in Exodus 19, the mountain of God's own choosing. And it doesn't have to be Mount Everest either. Standing on the summit where there was a great deal of fire and thick smoke, standing where there was a great deal of thunder and lightning. Yes, thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening. Standing where the Lord had descended, descended to deliver an imperative or ten. Standing where those incriminating tablets were delivered directly to Moses. An uber grand delivery at an uber grand place at the top of a mountain. The most intimidating mountain range, a range now known as El Laz, with mountains higher than any those Hebrews had ever encountered or will ever encounter in their licentious lifetime. So, this pictograph is an eminently reasonable representation of that mountain top topology, the topology of Moses standing on that frightening summit. It is a reasonably fair representation of their respective heights from their eastern campsite. Huge campsite. They even fit three million there. Yet, yeah, even more so, a reasonably fair representation when seen up close, when seen from the foot of the mountain, when seen in proper context, when seen relative to that calf topology. But moving on in our topological interpretation. The extension of that abdomen of Moses is not depicting his genitals. No, that would be a gross misrepresentation. Not anatomically correct, not even close. No, that extension is neither indicating a well-endowed gender nor indicating the level of excitement of Moses, but rather, I submit to you that this abdominal extension is an ancient you are here indicator, as I demonstrated repeatedly in my birthing billboard article, demonstrated more than 100 times, more like 200 times, and that is fully documented as well now. An extension that is synonymous to that primal tent spike, a logogram that we also demonstrated earlier, and that we will demonstrate yet again in a longer upcoming article. An ancient Hebrew logogram that is well documented by others as well. 
So no, this is this logogram or narrative is not just my imagination, folks. You are here is real. That being said, this abdominal extension is a logogram, indicating that this is the very topology where this narrative put down its roots. Put down its primal roots. Which is to say, the location of this inscription is where the spiking of those tablets occurred. A prime location for a prime beef. A perfectly visible and audible location, drawing crowds from the eastern camp as well as from the southern camp. A perfect location for a godly put-down about 600 yards from that calf, a spiking to spite its bovine face. A location that now has a wonderfully paved road bisecting those competing ideologies, bisecting that plane at the mountain base. And I fully expect the road to that golden calf smelter will soon be paved as well for all you pavement lovers out there. Now, as for the roads to those judgment seats, <laughs> not nearly as likely. Now, to repeat myself, I'm betting that the stippling surrounding those pillars was to indicate a rapid motion, was to indicate a furious smashing of those tablets at that very location, as in Hulk smash. in order to drive that monotheism home to all those idolatrous people. People that may be indicated there as well, indicated by those many stipples. But let's get back to the topical imperative here. Let's get back to the narrative proper. Let's get back to what is actually being said here instead of some locative topology, which is not nearly as important, not nearly as foundational. Now, I don't think it is much of a stretch to see that calf of our pictogram is being elevated to a higher position on this boulder, is being elevated higher than Moses at any rate, higher in prestige and higher in grammatical order. And this is not due to Egyptian hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics often running from top to bottom of often being vertical. Instead, this elevation is clearly diagonal, clearly diametric in this presentation, in this sinus degrade presentation. And to that diagonal end, you may see that the calf is well above Moses in this horizontal presentation, in what is definitely not an amusing cartoon and certainly not an Egyptian cartouche. A good head and shoulders above our Moses, when the calf could have been much more easily engraved right beside him. Yes, there is plenty of artistic space to work with here. After all, it's a pretty massive boulder, much bigger than the Hulk on a bad day. However, even more disturbing is that this calf is at the very same altitude as that lightning bolt. Is at the very same altitude of El. It seems that their former bull god of Egypt is being elevated to the very same level of El. An El of a situation, you might even say. Telling us that there is something competing with God right from the outset. That a certain something is being put before God, grammatically speaking, or that is competing with his divine imperative at the very least. But the convoluted imperative is clearly secondary here, whereas the L is clearly primary here, since the L is clearly being front-loaded here the L is clearly being prefaced. And that is our literary structure. That 
is our literary form that we so tediously started this article with. That is our leading, leady diagramming. Now, at which point you then have to address the adjectival narrative of good and bad, as opposite as those symbols appear in those opposing images. Narratives which Douglas Betteridge so helpfully provided in his groundbreaking chart. A narrative derived from an originally upright image, a narrative derived from the F-35 of Gardner's Egyptian sign list, a nuanced narrative adopted by these Hebrews in this era of linguistic plasticity, this era of language development. At which point, you simply have to factor into this narrative the operative imperative of either shall or shall not. Factor in the verbal imperative of those pillars in their proper context. And the adjectival narrative gives that away, telling you what is totally bad, telling you what is mere moose pew, while at the same time keeping in mind the bold positioning of those competing images in order to derive our, subsurf, our subversive subject, as well as our objective object. And again, I'm not talking about the bold positioning of Moses versus the calf here. Even less so the fanciful speculation of Moses sacrificing some elevated red or yellow cow here. Again, those are neither knives nor swords. Have you been following anything I said so far? Again, we are talking the relative positioning of that uppermost calf versus that uppermost el. A calf that thinks it is uppermost, ovation-wise. Okay, so, having read all of the inductive clues presented above, I'm asking you to write your very own transliteration below. I'm asking you to write your very own translation below. Just one little sentence in your very own words. You can do it. You can do it. And do take your time, since it's definitely worth it. Dum, 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 dum. No, why not? Curious. Not enough time? Not enough space? Or do you think this inscription is virtually meaningless and in a meaningless location? Even after I've just given you that amazing confluence of locations above, even after I've just given you that multitude of locations that converge in this particular Exodus narrative, along with all of those earlier convergences, is that you still want to believe in an Egyptian location of your Precious Mount Sinai, in your specious Mount Sinai, species, despite the profound lack of artifacts there. So where's your credibility now, huh? Since I've, a, I've already proven you utterly wrong in my earlier article, for that matter, proven your cash cow totally wrong in two or three earlier articles, proven you utterly wrong with science and proving you utterly wrong with epigraphy. In fact, I've proven you more than a million to one wrong, epigraphically speaking, despite giving you uber generous odds. Uber generous odds on only one of those local inscriptions, with that other inscription being equally as devastating, with more devastation to come. So you're probably terribly wrong on your meaningless ideology impression as well. Terribly wrong in this being a menial task, let alone a menial location. It seems you clearly haven't read my earlier articles and or seen them on my YouTube channel, despite being published for over a year now. You are either loopy or out of the loop. 
or perhaps you're just waiting for some academic consensus on my earlier articles. Some academic consensus. And overwhelming academic consensus from a bunch of cowards. Cowards that have not definitely seen my work. Definitely seen my work. Key players that have not responded in the least, even when Sony rebutted. Sorry, folks, but that academic dream is not about to happen for you. No, not before his kingdom comes at any rate. Nope, you're completely on your own here, reader. How do you like them autonomy apples? How do you like your free will now? So, do promise me that you will read those free articles then. Or at the very least, promise to watch that above shorter proof on YouTube then. A proof without any advertising whatsoever, since I don't need the money. Before moving on to this fitting conclusion, as fitting as a judgment seat, perhaps, this highly grammatical and fitting conclusion that I have provided below before rendering your ill-informed judgment, lest ill render judgment unto you. Okay, moving on to our fitting conclusion. So, based on the above information, you should clearly be able to transliterate me. Thou shalt have no other gods before. Me. Thou shalt have no other gods before. A commandment subsumes all other commandments, that totally consumes all other commandments, since they became, can become gods in themselves. A wonderful, wonderful re-presentation of that first and foremost commandment. A wonderfully artistic re-presentation by an illiterate man by an unlettered man at that. Now, isn't that embarrassing, huh? So, you got a stronger transliteration, dear reader? Or a better interpretation? An interpretation of such immense proportions? Of such worthy proportions? An interpretation that suits the immediate context better? An interpretation that even more integrated and even more innate that is even more cumulative as well as coherent that is even more systematic and yet simplistic if so I would really love to hear it I just love to have my ears tickled by it yeah just love it <laughs> cheers <laughs>